Hello, and welcome to How to Be Orange, the audiobook experience. I enjoyed writing the book, I certainly enjoyed reading it, and I hope you enjoy listening to it. Go to youtube.com slash Greg Shapiro and subscribe to my channel, and then you can click on the playlist. Enjoy. How to Be Orange, Chapter 8, How the Dutch See Themselves. The quote, Film is a country's ideology at its purest. Slavoj Žižek, philosopher. I dreamt I was in a crappy movie with Naomi Watts. Oh, wait. No, that, that really happened. One way to find out how a culture sees itself is to look at its cinema and directors. In the case of the Netherlands, the best-known directors seem like they're trying to be American. As a teenager... I saw Paul Verhoeven's Robocop, which exploited the American cop movie genre with such gleeful, gratuitous violence, I couldn't even watch the whole thing. Jan de Bont made Speed, a veritable homage to the Hollywood action movie. Next up for U.S. success was supposed to be Dutchman Dick Maas. Never heard of him? Not in America, no. Dick Moss has been making American knockoff films since the early 80s. I remember the boat chase in Amsterdam along the famous canals. But after the hero goes crashing into the rowing club, then a Dutch street organ, then an even more implausible brass band flotilla, you're left wondering if Dick Moss is taking it seriously or if he's just taking the piss. Is it homage or is it parody? To me, Dick Maas is kind of like the Dutch Ed Wood. The only way to enjoy his films is because they're so bad, they're good. Meanwhile, Maas continues making films for the Dutch, and Hollywood clearly prefers directors such as Dutchman Anton Corbijn. Dick Maas's first ever movie was De Lift in 1983. It was a simple horror story about an elevator where people were being killed by the elevator. For everyone who's ever wondered what happens if you would get your head caught between the elevator doors, this movie is for you. In the late 90s, to make his big jump to the U.S. market, Maas decided to redo his first movie with a die-hard makeover. The exteriors were filmed in Manhattan, but the bulk of the production took place in Almira by the Big Brother Studios. Since this time the movie was in English, they needed American actors. I went to the audition. Everyone from Boom Chicago tried out for this film. Ike Barinholtz got to play a fussy office assistant. Josh Myers, brother of Seth, was on a SWAT team. And I got a role as a tech nerd computer expert named Chip. Get it? The filming was scheduled for August of 2000, right in the middle of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, where I was performing for Boom Chicago. We told them I couldn't possibly do it unless they could somehow schedule all my scenes into the same 36 hours. Miraculously, they scheduled all my scenes into the same 36 hours. And the next thing I knew, I was on the set next to Naomi Watts. And I was the one being labeled as the prima donna. Being Dutch, Dick Maas puts the direct in director. As an actor, I enjoyed working with Maas. He was very upfront about what he wanted from the scene and what the story needed. Then again, Dick Maas is also a writer-director. As I am an actor-writer, I was a bit confused. On set, my text was being taken very seriously, but my character was being portrayed in the broadest stereotypes possible. In fact, it was less character and more caricature. Mass personally dictated the details of my nerd costume. It had to be mismatched suspenders and tie, goofy glasses, and food stains on my shirt. I remember we had to do a retake to make sure there was enough pizza sauce on me. Were we making some ironic statement about stereotypes? No. It seemed more like Dick was just having fun sticking in a joke whether it fit or not. Oh well, 
it wasn't supposed to be high art. But you have to give the man some credit for casting. At that point, I'd never heard of Naomi Watts. It was the year 2000. At that point, we were all more impressed with her co-star, James Marshall, from Twin Peaks. James was open and, and friendly, and he liked having an American to talk to on the set. I joked with him, and I told him he didn't need to seem as dumb as his character on TV in this movie. He eagerly agreed. After Twin Peaks, he had not only had to fight typecasting, he'd had to deal with a serious illness. This Dick Moss movie was to be his big comeback and his chance to play an intelligent role in a smart script. Clearly, his agent hadn't seen any Dick Moss movies. As for Naomi Watts, she was Australian. That's about all we knew. And I'd heard she'd grown up with Nicole Kidman. Naomi Watts, at that point, had a great Australian accent. It's the accent I've heard Australians refer to as strine. But she was working on her American accent for the film. We'd be running lines, and in a flawless American accent, she'd say, Chip, do you want a coffee? And then she'd turn aside and ask, Does that sound right? Thanks to Dick Moss, I'm proud to say I helped Naomi Watts with her American accent. We had a couple of scenes together. On camera, I played a nerd, and she played a smart, good-looking femme fatale who was way out of my league. Off camera, our relationship was no different. Naomi Watts and me. You can see our chemistry on screen for all of about 90 seconds. If you look for the film on DVD, well, you won't find it. Probably Naomi Watts' management saw to that. But the remarkable thing about this film, Down, was its timing. In the script, written by Dick Moss, the killer elevator now is killing in Manhattan. And it kills so many people that even the White House gets involved. The president calls it terrorism and sends in commandos with stingers, anti-aircraft missiles. Now, of course, this was standard film script fodder for every movie that came out after September 11th. But here's the thing. Dick Moss's movie came out before September 11th, a week before. Down, the movie, opened on the 5th of September 2001. For a week, it did rather well. But somehow, after September 11th, no one wanted to see a horror movie set in Manhattan about people dying in a skyscraper. Yet, for a film that came out before 9-11, this Dutch guy, Dick Maas, came up with some incredibly prescient dialogue. Of course, Maas needed a missile launcher in his story to set up the obligatory explosion at the end, but how did he justify it? Here's some of the text. Commando 1. Why do we need stingers? Commando 2. Terrorists have airplanes too. And this bit. Commando 1. Up we go. Commando 2. If you see Bin Laden, say hello. Say what you will about Dick Moss's movies, but he did kind of predict 9-11. The week before 9-11. In retrospect, I'm not sure if that's a credit to Dick Moss or if it's because 9-11 was, in fact, so predictable. Either way, the Netherlands is still stuck with him. One of my first impressions of Dutch culture was a Dutch art house film I saw in Chicago. The film came out before I even knew that I would be moving to the Netherlands. So I suppose it must have made a good impression. Sporlos was the movie, featuring a mild-mannered Dutchman who was also a statistic killer. A very good first impression. In America, we like our happy endings, even if it means a tacked-on Hollywood ending. Dutch movies don't have happy endings. Dutch movies just end. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, Boy and girl get together for an obligatory nude scene and probably have sex anyway. Do they live happily ever after? Probably not. Sporlos, the movie, is even better. Spoiler alert, I'm about to give away the ending to this movie that you may have seen ages ago and don't quite remember. Sporlos is a movie about a guy whose wife gets kidnapped. Actually, it's not his wife, they're just living together because it's Nederland. 
boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy goes crazy looking for girl. And he finally meets the guy who kidnapped her. He's this creepy Dutch family man with a pointy beard. And pointy beard says, you want to know what happened to your girlfriend? Well, I can't tell you, but I can show you. And the boyfriend is so desperate, he says, yes. He lets himself be drugged and the screen goes black. The next thing we see is a lighter in the darkness. Flick, flick. And we hear the sound of dirt being shoveled onto a coffin. Our hero is being buried alive, just like his girlfriend. The end. I had never seen a movie like this before. In fact, it was a bit of a cult hit in America. Lots of people were talking about the film saying, whoa, the Dutch are hardcore. And of course, not long after, there was a Hollywood remake, The Vanishing, starring Kiefer Sutherland. It's a lot like watching any episode of 24 with Jack Bauer. He's desperate, looking for clues, torturing people. And then he meets the kidnapper, played by Oscar winner Jeff Bridges, whose Dutch accent wins the award of worst ever. Spoiler alert, the rest is the same shot by shot. Our hero drugs himself, wakes up in a box, and flicks on his lighter. The only difference is, it's America, so they had to use a big Zippo lighter. But Hollywood did it. They killed the hero. Hardcore. Then they tried the film in front of American test audiences. And the Americans said, I don't get it. How does he get out of the box? The studio explained, that's the whole point. He doesn't. Surprise ending. The test audiences still didn't get it. But, what? Well, How's there a happy ending? There is no happy ending. It's about how desperate the main character was. Oh, okay, said the test audiences. But seriously, how does he get out of the box? So, of course, they filmed a different ending. Kiefer Sutherland is in the box. Jeff Bridges finishes shoveling the dirt. Cut to a new girlfriend who, for some reason, is driving around in the woods, and suddenly she stops. Is that digging I hear? She rushes into the middle of the forest and somehow, in the dark, she detects freshly turned earth. Then she's digging up our hero for no reason. She pries open the box and there he is. But she's too late. He's already dead. Or is he? <gasps> our hero wakes up with a huge breath of relief and hugs his new girlfriend happy ending. Oh, but wait, here comes the bad guy. He's got a shovel and he wants to kill our hero and the girlfriend. So they shoot him and he's dead. Or is he? Just as they hug again, the killer wakes up uh, and grabs the girlfriend so that Kiefer Sutherland has to whack him over the head with the shovel. He smashes Jeff Bridges until he drops the shovel and literally has to look into the camera and say, it's over. It's over. That's what it took for the American test audiences to finally be satisfied. <laughs> okay, I guess it's over. Of course, for the Dutch market, if they would have filmed a separate ending, the hero would have killed the bad guy, had sex with his girlfriend, and then died. Do they live happily ever after? Probably not. <laughs>